voyage, they drove, they went to Chicago to see Hamilton, the musical. And oh, wow. I had tickets for Hamilton for 2020, but it got cancelled because of the pandemic. And I am going to see it in May. I'm finally, I'm the only person in the world that hasn't seen Hamilton. Have you, have you watched it on Disney? I've watched it on Disney, you? No, okay, so you're not the only person in the world. Amber also hasn't seen I mean, I know this one. So I'm very excited, but my, my kids, who are like now 28 and 25, they saw it in Chicago. Oh, I mean, I've, we've often been to Chicago. So yes, so yes, you're practically, you're only, uh, you, you're, you're quite close to Toronto. All right. You're closer to Toronto than any other big cities. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and get started here. Go ahead, go ahead. Thank I'm you ready. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our uh, um observance of our, of international day of women and uh, girls in science this is the lovely professor dawn uh she works with uh arctic plants she works with arctic plants and she's going to tell us all about that thank you so much amber and emma um i hope we're going to see me can i start the video it says you it says i can't start the video you have to start it for me can you start my video? So sorry about that. Yes. Jolly good. Okay, that is Just fantastic. One sec. And can, can I share my screen? Am I a co-host? <laughs> we'll get there. Are we good? Not yet. Okay. Oh, I'm a co-host. There we go. So sorry. You should be a co-host now. We forgot about Lovely. Her. I am a co-host. Excellent. And I'm going to start my video. I'm not going to start my video. Hang on a minute. Let me. Can you see me? Oh, there I am. Okay. Hi, everyone. Lovely to be here at the International Day of Women and Girls in um, Science. And I'm actually going to give myself a magical, I'm going to the Arctic right now. And um, I should be able to add an image. Let's see if I can get it. Um, I'm going to immediately zoom up to really far north. Actually, I think it's Greenland. Let me just be there in a sec. Uh, National Biodiversity Teaching. Ooh, let's see if this works. Ah. Aha, this is Greenland and in the background somewhere there is a glacier. So, okay, awesome. We can get going now. Okay, I'm gonna, and let's get going. There's always a few technical difficulties I find. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, we're celebrating the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. So I'm very excited to be here uh, for this and for the wonderful National Biodiversity Teaching. And today I'm gonna take you up to the Arctic where the plants are really, really, really short and where the Inuit, the indigenous people of Canada who live in these um, very cold uh, biomes actually make a lot of use of plants even though there's snow and ice on the ground for most of the year. But first I want to um, give a land acknowledgement to remind all of us, us that in North America, if you're here and in all other parts of the world, there are indigenous people in Canada, First Nations, Inuit, Métis. So I'm a professor at York University in Toronto and this is a place where we acknowledge that there are many long-standing relationships before Europeans arrived. And the current uh, treaty holders are the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Though in the past, this area has been taken care of by the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Huron-Wendat. So there's this massive long history. And interestingly, you may have heard of, of wampum, uh, there is a uh, dish with one spoon, wampum belt covenant, covenant that is there to tell us to respect the land uh, in the Great Lakes region. So um, since, uh, since the students running today's event are over 
in Chicago, Illinois, on the shores of a great lake. I encourage you all to check out this history. It's like super interesting. And uh, at that, from at this point, I'm going to now switch you to an Arctic frame of mind. So the lady in this photograph, her name is Mina Ishulutak, and she is a friend of mine. She has taught me a lot of words in Inuktitut, which is the um, the language of the of that's spoken um, by Inuit people in the Nunavut region. Um, there are dialects across the entire uh, Arctic regions from Canada to Alaska to Greenland, or Kalalit Nunat, and I'm gonna be introducing you to some of those words. So this isn't just about plants, it's kind of a bit of a language lesson as well. And Mina, who is um, lighting a traditional oil lamp where for which plants are really important um, to welcome uh, guests into the North, into the Arctic, is also a filmmaker. So that'll be at the end. So here we are above the tree line in tundra biomes and the man standing on an ice pack in the north of Norway in July is my former student, Andrew, who's now like a professor with his own children who may or may not be um, watching this. I think they're a little bit young. Um, so he's obviously taller than all of the plants. So. Arctic and alpine, so flowers and plants that grow either up mountains or up in the Arctic, tend to have very distinctive life forms called cushion plants. So in the top right, you can see a cushion plant. And then you can see that if you want to take a photograph of a tiny Arctic flower, you have to do yoga because you've got to be flexible enough to be able to get down on the ground with your camera lens, get really up close and personal, right? Um, and then yeah, and then get back up again. So in ecology, because I'm an ecology professor, gradients are really important. And what is a gradient? A gradient is just a shift along space or time. So um, you could have in a river, it would be fresh water. The ocean is salt water. If you go to a marshy area between the sort of the ocean and a river, uh, that would be there'd be um, a salinity, a salty gradient where some bits would be fresh and some bits would be saltier. So you can have a gradient along any kind of um, type of measurement unit. And in this case, so I'm just gonna move my things down. I am, I'm always trying to move my stuff around. I hope you can see that. Um, okay, in this case, uh, I'm going to talk about latitudinal gradients. So if, if we had, um, a really useful um, machine from Star Trek, and we could beam ourselves to the latitude, to uh, um, the middle, the central part of the world, and we either walked north or south towards the North Pole or the South Pole, we would sort of be in tropical rainforest at first, then we would keep walking north through the United States towards Canada, we'd be in Mexico for the first bit, then the USA, and we would get into uh, just regular forest, maybe some prairies, keep going north. If you're in Alaska, you're gonna start hitting snow fields and very short vegetation. If you keep going even further north, you get to the snow line, um, you get to ice, There's a there is a glacier in the background of this picture. And there's really, it looks like, it looks like just rocks, but there's actually a lot of plants in that photo behind me. So that's a latitudinal gradient. Now, if you're walking up a mountain, you would be experiencing an altitudinal gradient from sea level at ground level, um, like up to the top of the mountain, and you would pass by same kind of um, vegetation. So at the bottom, there'd probably be some nice trees and forests, and then you would go higher and the trees would be getting shorter into shrubs. Then you probably hit some like grassland and eventually you get to the snow line, right? So again, an altitudinal gradient. And these kind of gradients um, are driven, uh, the, the, the vegetation that grows there um, is, it, it all looks quite similar in areas with similar kind of rainfall and similar temperature. So if you are in a hot, dry place, you will be in a desert. If you were in, are in a hot, 
wet place, you would be in a tropical rainforest. So a lot of precipitation, a lot of water, a lot of moisture, a um, lot of rain. If you were in um, a cold, dry place, you're in the tundra. And guess what? You're also in a desert. So Arctic regions where there, there are no trees, there are, there are woody plants, but they are, excuse me a minute, something is, is ringing. Get rid of that. Guess I put my phone on silence, but I didn't put my iPad on silent. Um, it's actually a cold desert. Most people think of deserts as being really hot, but you can have cold deserts too. Let me see if I can move this out of the way. I don't know if this is going to move. Um, so a desert is a biome. A forest is a biome. Tundra is a biome. And that is a formation of plants and animals that can be seen from space. Like you can see that they're really big picture features uh, on the land that have similar characteristics because the climates are similar. And you can find a desert in Australia. You can find a desert in North Africa. You can find a desert in the United States of America, like the Chihuahua Desert. You can find a desert in Asia, the Gobi Desert, and they all have maybe different species, but they all look similar in, the, in, in their appearance. This is a Wikipedia definition. And I would like you all to remind your teachers that it is okay for students to read Wikipedia because it's an open access encyclopedia with pretty strict rules about what is there. And um, you shouldn't necessarily use it for your essay, but you can find probably better references, but you can jump off from there. So it's okay. Now I wanna show you a map of Canada and this is a map of the, and I've still got things dinging at me. I don't really understand why they're dinging, but never mind. Um, you can see from the western part of Canada to the eastern part of Canada, there are four Inuit regions, the or Inuit Nunungat, the Inuit homelands of Canada. And they've all got um, their own government. So it's a, like a territorial government and they have land claim agreements. So in the West, we've got the Inuvialuit settlement region. In the middle bit, and it's really big, we have Nunavut, which has got all those high Arctic islands, including uh, Baffin Island and Devon Island. I'll show you pictures from there. And you'll really, you will not see trees above three inches tall, but the trees are kind of lying flat on the ground. They, there are willows there. They're just not growing vertical. There's Nunavik, and Nunatsia foot. So these are all um, Arctic regions of Canada. I'm just going to check the questions. Um, oh, um, I'll, I'll wait to the end. We've got some good questions, but I'm glad to see them coming in and I will be answering those questions. So post your... Okay, let's see if I can. Okay, right. So I want you to think about latitudes here for a minute. This is um, a map of the world showing major kinds of biomes. That kind of salmon pink color in North Africa and Australia. Look, Australia is like pretty much all desert, eh? Um, and through Asia, we've got salmon pink. And in the western, southwestern part of the United States, that's desert biomes. The gray areas are tundra and uh, south of it, the dark gray is boreal forest. Now, what I've, and then you've got bright green in like South America, that's like the Brazilian rainforest, right? And in Central Africa and Indonesia. So um, tropical rainforests. Now, what's interesting about this map of the major biomes of the world is um, that if you draw an arrow from east to west, at the same latitude, you can immediately see that the gray zones in North America, Canada and Alaska come far further south and they kind of hit that line. Whereas in contrast in Europe, you can see that the green areas, the light green, which is boreal forest, like conifers, a lot of Christmas trees, um, 
and even some temperate forests like we have here in Ontario and Illinois, they go like above that line. And on there, I have actually put an arrow to a city in Norway called Tromsø. And then on the left-hand side in North America near Greenland, I've put a star and that's kind of the area where this photo uh, at the back of me is. And you can see that there's, it's like Greenland is white because there is an ice cap. There's like an ice sheet covering Greenland, right? And unfortunately, because of climate change, it is melting. So you might wonder why in Europe and as we head towards uh, Siberia in Russia, the gray zones, the tundra, the light gray is much higher above that latitudinal line. Well, it has to do with ocean currents. And if you heard Deanna um, Leonard's talk about whales, she was talking about how whales move things uh, around like uh, nutrients and they dive deep, deep, dive deep and they are a form of disturbance. But there are all these ocean currents and all those uh, marine mammals are tracking them because the food is coming with the currents. And this brown, these brown lines, these arrows, that is actually the Gulf Stream, which is a warm water current that originates in the Gulf of Mexico. And then it travels across the Atlantic in a northeasterly direction. And it brings warm water to Britain and Iceland and Northern Europe. And that totally influences the biome type. And that's why we've got forests that are much further north than they are in North America. So I want to take you next to a botanical garden in Tromsø and where we are um, right now, I'm down where the Great Lakes are below that line uh, on Lake Ontario and uh, the natural habitat would be forest. We destroyed a lot of it, paved it over. But if there were no people, no, no uh, European settlers here and um, suburbs, it'd be forest. There'd be a little bit of prairie, but mostly forest. And a beautiful plant that's growing in it is called white trillium. It is the provincial flower of Ontario. And I'm going to show you a weird place where I saw trillium growing. So here we are in northern Norway, Tromsø Botanical Garden. And there's some nice signage showing all those cold water currents and warm water currents. And Botaniska Haga means botanical garden. Now, when you go to this garden, you can actually see this Trillium grandiflorum or white trillium or in Norwegian, Stortreblad, growing there. If you went to the same latitude in North America, Nunavut, that, that wouldn't even survive for two minutes outdoors. Uh, but it's it can survive in northern Norway because of the warm water currents. So temperature precipitation makes a huge impact on what can live and grow where. The rest of the uh, uh, vegetation in that garden is typical Arctic plants, these lovely cushion plants. And they have a name called hemi, which means half, cryptophyte means kind of hidden. Um, so half hidden, they aren't total cryptophytes where you can't even see that it's a plant. But um, most of their gr uh, growing buds are like hidden deep down inside that cushion, protected from the cold. And there, if you if you stick a thermometer in the middle of these plants, you would in a, in in the cold, you would actually measure a higher temperature because the heat is being kept inside. It's being trapped by the hairs on the leaves. It's being trapped by dead leaves. It's like an insulation, like you insulate your house to keep the heat in, right? So this is this typical growth form that we see in the tundra. Um, and even the trees and bushes, you can see there's like a little pine in the background on the uh, in the photo on the left hand side. Um, and it's like a miniature pine. Why do they grow like that? Well, any parts of plants that were to grow taller than the snowbank or the snowpack in the winter would just get completely killed off, shaved off by, you know, minus 40 uh, Fahrenheit or Celsius winds or whatever. So hemicryptophytes are cushion plants with their buds at the soil surface that are protected by snow and 
scales of leaves and by dead leaves. Now, this is the only, I think I've got two graphs to show you in this talk because it is like a science, uh, celebrating science today, the biodiversity teaching. If we look at this graph on the bottom left, there's two colors of bars. One is white and one is black. Okay, now, there are different kinds of, of um, plants, and I'm going to show you there's one word on the bottom left that says phanerophyte. Hmm, what's a phanerophyte? That is a fancy name for a tree. So it turns out that if you look at the white bar, about 50%, about half of the flowering plants in the world, um, or the plants, are are um trees they look like trees you go to a forest you see a tree the tree is taller than you right it's a tree but if you look at the black bar that's actually telling you uh that you basically find like no trees in arctic regions because if they grow up above that snowpack they're like god the wind just kills them so most of the kind of plants you see are these camiphytes. Um, that's on the right hand side, like a low lying sprawling plant or a hemicryptophyte. And uh, there are actually willows, as in willow trees in the Arctic, but they're not growing up. They're growing flat, parallel to the ground. Uh, this is my friend, Professor Lynn Mormon. She's a geoscientist and we often work together. And uh, she's always trying to educate me about rocks, you know, metamorphic rocks, um, igneous rocks. But actually, when she's showing me these rocks, I was noticing that in the rocks, there was, it was very cold and windy when we were on this island in um, Nunatsiavut, north of Labrador, uh, on that coast. But I was saying, but look at all these microclimates, because the wind is uh, there's protection from that really cold wind. And you often get plants that like growing in these tiny microclimates. So microclimates are really important. Arctic plants can make their own warm microclimate, but if a seed lands in one of these cracks in the rock and some soil forms, that's gonna allow a plant to grow. Okay, let's go to Baffin um, Island now. And Talarutit is its name in Inuktitut. This is getting into what we call the high Arctic. So even within the Arctic, there are zones like low Arctic, high Arctic. Believe it or not, all that means low Arctic is at lower latitudes. High Arctic is higher latitudes. So high Arctic is where you really find this polar desert. And this is beachy, the, the famous slash infamous slash notorious beachy island because there was um, um, a navy expedition sailed from Britain in the 1840s to 50s. They were trying to sail through the Northwest Passage to find the shortcut route to go from Europe to China instead of like sailing halfway around the world and south of uh, off the southern coast of Africa or around the southern part of South America. So this was just a more direct route and the sailors, they all died basically, but it, they were sort of trapped up there for two to three years. And in the first year, there were graves of the sailors on this island. So it's kind of uh, a place where you can really um, see this history in action. And that pebble beach, honestly, it really looks like there's not much there. But if you get right down, you'll see there's lots of these adorable tiny Arctic poppies and other um, Arctic avens and mouse ear chickweed. There's like a lot of stuff going on in that polar desert. So it is a desert. There are flowers. They're just super tiny. Okay. See if I can get to the next one. Okay, so what's been going on over evolutionary times, and I keep trying to move myself here, is that, um, oh, I'm going to do this. There we are. Okay, there we are. I, th I think this is better now. Um, maybe I do that. Is that natural selection has shaped um, Arctic willow species, for example. So in the top right hand side, there's a giant, beautiful willow tree. Uh, from my local park here in Toronto. And then when you get up into the Arctic, you can see there's always people lying on the ground to take photographs in the Arctic. That's the takeaway, right? Is you've got to get right down. Um, those low bushes, there are willow bushes. Um, 
And oh, I can see there's lots of questions lining up. What's the, oh, I'm gonna have fun answering these questions. I'll do that at the end, yeah. Um, okay. Um, so those are both willows and there's an even a tinier willow which literally has two leaves and a tiny willow flower and it's just so it's called snowbed willow it's so tiny and this is um the adaptation to these really tough uh conditions and on the left hand side we obviously as humans we can learn and this is um a statue of the famous arctic explorer from norway raul amundsen um, and he is actually, he lived with Inuit people in Canada in Central Arctic in Joe Haven. And he is wearing his traditional Inuit parka and his polar bear fur trousers. Um, yeah, so um, we can adapt through learning. Plants adapt from one generation to the next for whatever species will survive. So we're up on the tundra, we're in the Arctic. There's snow there until, in some cases, May, June. It takes a long time for it to melt. Then um, it melts, and then the snow and the fall, the autumn, come back really quickly. So the tundra is about short growing seasons. This is me doing field work. Somebody asked, when did I first go up to the Arctic? And it was like in 1980. I was uh, like 19. I was in the subarctic, but it was a zone of tundra on Hudson Bay. And I was working as a field assistant. I was a student at the University of Toronto. And I got to go help um, a, a woman who was doing her master's of science, looking at how vegetation grows on the tundra. So in the tundra and the reason why i'm digging snow is because melt is happening and it's happening really fast and we're basically on a camp in a river and when everything melts you just basically um have a river running through the front door and the back door of your cabin it's just like it's it's flooded so we're, we're living in a flood i mean but we're adapted for that okay um so once the snow melts what will happen is there's a very short, very intense growing season. Now, in the Arctic, there's not a lot of time for seeds to germinate and grow, but plants do produce seeds and the seeds blow around. They may or may not find somewhere to um, become established and germinate, you know, establish and have a little seedling, but most of the seeds die. Um, and in fact, it's mostly perennial plants. And most of the biomass is actually below the ground. So this is an interesting photo from the high Arctic. And I hope that what you can see here is um, it's like this sort of pebble beach and um, there's an outwash zone and it's very icy, but because of the freeze thaw cycle, the ground is like ripping apart. Now, if you look above ground, there's like tiny bits of vegetation and plants, but when you look underneath, it's like roots everywhere. Right. So that's where that's where the plants are. They're living underground as roots. You're not seeing much going on above ground. Uh, so this is a little bit about um, and thank you for whoever um, uh, asked for captioning. And I hope that we got some cap close captioning and transcripts. That's really helpful. Um, I live in Toronto on the left hand side. You can see here is the Great Lakes. Hey, Chicago is there for the students running this event. There you are. And um, I'm showing the flight between Churchill on Hudson Bay, where I was studying this grass, this, this, this salt marsh grass and putting up little fences to keep snow geese out. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, that's like over 40 years ago now that I got to do that. So um, we get there, we set up camp, we're waiting for the snow to melt. We're studying the geese are, the snow geese are eating that salt marsh grass. They're molting feathers. They're laying eggs. They're make, they're raising goslings. Chicks are hatching and they're just like eating this grass, right? But most of the vegetation is the roots underground. So yeah, um, I lived on an island 
in a river delta called the Mast River of a river that was flowing into La Perouse Bay, which was on the shores of Hudson Bay. And there were polar bears around. And you can see me in that top photo on the left in that green army surplus sweater. And we had to be really careful because polar bears were eating my experiments and the experiments of the graduate students I was working with. And they were like walking through the cabins. Eventually we got a... Um, electric fence. So it was quite exciting. So I did a Bachelor of Science in Biogeography and Environmental Studies, like Botany Geography. Then I did a Master's in Botany at the University of Toronto. Then I studied sheep grazing behavior. Sheep. Sheep are awesome. They're really smart. Okay, let's get to getting towards the end now. So what is happening in that summer growing season is photosynthesis 24-7. So the Arctic Right now, it's long, dark days. There's very little daylight uh, because of the tilt of the of the Earth on its axis, um, which gives us our seasons. It's why we have to change our time. It's why days are longer in the summer and shorter in the winter. Uh, so up in the Arctic, the days can be like 20 hours of sunlight. And that means these plants, they're like growing, 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 photosynthesis all the way. And so the leaves are like little factories, as you know, they're, they're producing sugar and starch and proteins and amino acids and nucleic acids. And these, these primary metabolites are everywhere. I have put a link in here that we'll, we'll try and send out to you because that is a link to the photosynthesis song. Everyone should know that. Teachers should play it for all of you. It's a very catchy tune. Now, chlorophyll is green. That is what's making plants green. And that's what's doing the work of photosynthesis, right? To fix carbon and they're taking in carbon dioxide and giving off oxygen that stops us from going blue because we need oxygen. But there's a whole bunch of other pigments in leaves that like the red pigments, the yellow pigments that are all helping with photosynthesis and they're found in the chloroplast. I'll try and put this up here. I just hope you can see um, everything. Uh, okay, so let's go back to Hudson Bay. We've got snow melt. We've got roots. The roots have got like sugars and starches, and they immediately push all that energy into above ground. It's getting warmer. There's photosynthesis. These are willow bushes, and all of a sudden, before you blink, like you right before your eyes. There are flowers, there are leaves. It's just happening. It's happening over the space of about like literally eight to 10 weeks. Everything's going crazy. And then you get into um, fall or autumn. The days start getting shorter and you start to see Aurora Borealis. And in fact, this is um, the effect of that cooler weather on the north side of this boardwalk near um, some, some glaciers in Greenland, you can see that those pink leaves, that's on blueberries, it's actually turning because it's cold in that shadow. So autumn is coming early. And here we are in another part of the Canadian Arctic uh, in October, and you can see there's already snow um, you've already got these red leaves. Everything is everything is turning super fast. So there are flowers, there are seeds, but there is seed dispersal. But honestly, most plants are perennial because they just don't have time to grow as seeds. They have some interesting strategies. Like this is the grass on the left-hand side where the seeds actually germinate in the mother plant. So little seedlings drop off onto the ground. Other plants um, don't even need to be pollinated. They will flower and produce a seed that's an identical clone of the mother plant. And of course, lots of seeds disperse by blowing around. Now we do know for like decades that climate change is making longer growing seasons. And this is a 2006 map from the United States National Arbor Day Foundation in which they actually redrew the gardening zones. So, you know, there are some things depending on where you live in North America, you can't plant plants that grow like a poinsettia. If you lived in Mexico, you could have it in your back garden. 
I've got a point set here from Christmas, still going strong in my front room. I put it out in the summer, but if I put it out right now, it'll just die, it's just too cold. So actually we can grow more plants um, in further north because climate change is, is, is making everything warmer. And in the United States, uh, a lot of many states have shifted a full hardiness zone. So you can grow, I don't know if I'm ever gonna grow a banana outside here, but you can certainly grow um, plants in Toronto gardens and you see trees that usually survived further south. They would not survive up here. So when we're in the Arctic, how do we know what's there? Well, we've got loads of books that tell us um, there's all kinds of guidebooks. There's um, very technical science floras with lots of Latin names. Then there's nice guides with lots of pictures. I like the guides with pictures. So in Greenland, for example, there's about 500 native species, some introduced species being brought in from other parts of the world. They don't tend to survive too well. You've got these lovely guides. There's like little maps. There's nice pictures. They give you a Latin name. They give you a common name. This is a great place to learn to identify plants because unlike a tropical rainforest, there's not that much there. So plants have got Latin names, they've got common names, and these days they have barcodes as well. Um, so we've got the, the, these three different kinds of, of, of books telling you what's there. As I mentioned, the field guide with pictures, the floras with like for sciencey people like me, very technical, and then somebody Everywhere in the Arctic always knows what plant is there and they have a local plant list. So there's flowers in the Arctic, there's ferns, there's mosses, there's lichens, which are is a symbiosis between a fungus and a photosynthetic algae. Um, here's more lichens. Top right looks like dead wood, go figure. Bottom right is some kind of golden lichen. Um, there's also like seaweedy algae things that are just, and, and lots of bacteria. So a lot of microbes. Next, I want to talk about um, how um, Inuit use plants because it's a very short growing season. So you'd think, well, how important could plants be? The answer is they're really important. So um, ethnobotany is the field of biology that studies how people use plants for medicine, indigenous people. Um, but I apply ethnobotany to everyone because everyone in the world uses plants. So this is a beautiful um, ethnobotany book um, from Inuvialuit region in the Western part of Canada where elders worked with um, an academic, with a scholar from a college to collect all this amazing information. And uh, that book is really hard to get. You literally have to fly all the way up to the Arctic to buy that book. And I was able to um, get some, which I'm really excited about. So this is one of my friends who is a young Inuk woman. She's a mom now, but her name is Jen. And um, this is her wearing her traditional, part of her traditional clothing. And uh, it turns out the Inuit use plants in, as food, as medicine. Um, they're important for sled dogs stories and songs and for wildflowers. So it's not just about the edible plants, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how they're used and then some edible plants and then we'll get to questions. So um, yeah, it's dark for most of the year. How do you keep yourself warm? Um, and how do you have light when you're in a snow house? Well, there's this traditional soapstone oil lamp called the Kudlik and um, you would burn in, back in the day, it would have been, seal blubber oil from an animal um a marine mammal that was that was hunted and but the wick of the kudlik or soapstone lamp was always made from a mixture of cotton grass um and dried moss and somebody would have to tend this and that lamp that you see would be used for both warmth and light and entertainment you know as the fire in the evening to sing songs and tell stories and it's plants that provide the wicks. So in the autumn, in the fall, uh, elders would get everybody out there collecting all of these dried cotton grass and willow flowers as well. Willow flowers are used and you've got to have enough to get you through the winter. Uh, there are no willow bushes, big long willow bushes to weave baskets. So what do we make baskets from? Well, believe it or not, they're woven from grass. 
and in a set of islands in the um, Hudson Bay, the art of weaving beautiful baskets from grass was actually lost and then revived. The community decided they were going to come together to revive this. And this is, uh, you, you, you can find these grasses, grass baskets, and they're absolutely gorgeous. So here's an Arctic willow. The tree is like lying flat. And um, Ukpi Supatilu is the Inuktitut name. And Suputit is the fluffy seeds. Ukpi is the woody stem. Uh, this is, interestingly, the source of aspirin for us. It's, so it's an important medicinal. Um, it's got edible leaves. You can you could burn the twigs for a fire and you could use the fluffy seeds uh, um, if there is enough of it for your oil lamp. OK, so we heard a lot from Diana about whales and stuff. So traditional Arctic food would be whales and narwhals um, and fish. It's a it's a meat heavy diet because you can't really have kind of farming, but there's lots of cool berries like this, these blueberries and um, Inuit will, they'll go out and harvest berries and then rely on them in the winter. There is a very common berry called crowberry um, in Petrum nigrum, and it kind of turns your teeth black and it's not as tasty as a blueberry, but it's collected and much sought after. <gasps> This is an amazing berry. It's called cloudberry. Yeah, it is a relative of raspberry and strawberry, um, but every plant only produces one berry. So um, the patches of the bog where this plant grows are carefully tended. Now, like a lot of Arctic and boreal plants in the, the, the boreal forest, the biome goes right around the world. Like we saw that map of the world, right? Like it's circum, circum, um, Polar means right around the world. Circumboreal means that zone is right around the world. And it means that there are cloudberries that are eaten in Norway and Sweden, and um, they're often featured in cross stitching and embroidery, like, and they have lots of cool names. And you can actually go to Ikea, you can actually buy cloudberry jam there. Um, if you see it, buy it because it's difficult to get a hold of. Here's another popular veggie to eat, mountain sorrel. And it is absolutely, totally tasty. Now, scurvy grass, which is um, looks quite similar, but different species, which sailors would often collect. It's a weed. They'd get it, eat it as a source of vitamin C because uh, you have to have vitamin C. Otherwise, you, you're not very healthy in your diet. So they would take limes and lemons with them, um, like, you know, um, basically uh, oranges, a a anything. Um, of that sort would give you your vitamin C and citrus fruits. That was what I was trying to say. But this is really, really tasty. I love it. Um, the national flower of Greenland, dual fireweed, is totally edible. You can have a salad. You can make a pudding. Oh, delicious. Seaside bluebells. Oh, also delicious. So lots of edible plants out there. And recently, there's been some beautiful books. Um, from right across the Canadian Arctic in which elders have worked with um, botanists to uh, create educational materials, including Walking with Alasi, one of my favorites. And this was recently updated. It's really easy to get a hold of. I just saw it's on sale for 19 Canadian dollars, used to be 25 bucks. So there's a lot of resources out there. And I'm gonna end here because I wanna answer questions. Um, you can also go on to an actual encyclopedia, but if you Google Polar Ecosystem by David Klein, you should be able to get this really nice article about Arctic uh, vegetation. So I'm going to end there. I'm going to um, go into the Q&A and say, was, hi, hi, Amber. Hi, Emma. Hey, so I'm done. I'm gonna, uh, can I answer some questions? So sorry, we were having audio problems earlier. So, okay, we fixed that. Yes, of course. So we actually have a couple of questions um, from in the room uh, starting off while we uh, scroll. Uh, and there's lots of questions in the Q&A. So I'll um, pick that up as well. So go ahead and then I'll go oh, through all those questions. I had a question which was like, what what kind of gear do you require to like go all the way up to the Arctic? Like how much does that all cost? Oh, well, so that's kind of two questions. So first of all, how do you dress? So I showed you the photograph of Raoul Amundsen. So, um, and I have a lot of Inuit colleagues. So so a lot of them do wear traditional um, 
uh, seal skin outfits because fur is really the warmest. Um, and I actually do have like fur mittens that friends of mine have made for me who are who are um, Inuk friends. So one Inuit person is an Inuk. So my, some of my Inuk friends have actually sewn mittens for me. And then the rest of us are just wearing like I'm wearing something called should I be advertising icebreaker? We wear a lot of wool. We You layer up. When we're there in the summer, it's not as cold as it is now, but I have been there and it's like minus 20, minus 30. Okay, here's my main piece of advice, everybody. Do wear plastic frames because I once wore metal frames and I got frostbite crossing the road to the high school in Fort Simpson. I was going to give it to Pocket Cross and, 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 and like my metal glasses stuck to my nose and I pulled it off and it was like, it was just be careful. Okay, you can get frostbite. So I'm going to go now and um, answer. Do you have another question? Oh, oh, and how much does it cost? Ah, that is a really good question. In Europe, you can drive to the Arctic because there is infrastructure and roads. In Canada, you got to fly in or you have to sail there. You can't drive there, right? You can't drive there. So it costs a lot of money. And um, actually, um, transport and travel for Inuit in the Arctic is prohibitively expensive. So uh, they, there are ice roads in the winter, like you can drive, you can go across the ice, but because of climate change, a lot of those roads are melting and like there's a lot of slumping. So things are really changing fast, but it's expensive to get there. And most Canadians, it would be a bucket list kind of thing to get to the Arctic because it's super expensive to take. One of those flights could be thousands of dollars. Yeah. So we had a question in chat, which was just like, how often are you in the Arctic? So I am lucky. Uh, Last summer, I actually uh, do public science as an onboard botanist for an ecotourism company called Adventure Canada. Uh, I know the family. It's uh, women led, led by women. It's second generation. The children of the man that founded it like over 30 years ago. And so last summer, I was actually that with with the pandemic, we could they, they, it's opened up with rules to stop the spread of COVID. So I was there for, I'm gonna say, oh dear, probably um, nearly two months on a ship going through the Northwest Passage. Um, but before that, I have done field work in Sweden in the Arctic, field work in uh, Northwest Territory. So when I'm there, it's usually for field research, studying plants. And that's more in the summer. Um, um, I've been there in the winter for conferences as well. But it's but it's difficult to it's difficult and expensive to get to. But when people go, they absolutely fall in love with it. It's just amazing. It's so stunning. Like you can see that's Greenland. Isn't that like unbelievable? Right. I think over on the left, you can't really see it, but there's a glacier. So um, I hope that answered. I'm going to just go through. There are questions in the Q&A that I can see. I'll quickly go through. From just after we start our start, what is the correlation between Arctic plants and the Arctic animals in regards to food or the health of the plants? Uh, there's a lot of inter. I think I think this is what the question is about. Um, it's about that uh, th there are very close connections between Arctic animals and Arctic plants. So there are animals like musk oxen, caribou, snow geese, and they're eating any vegetation. So there is like a food chain. There is a food chain and they're all very connected. And of course, like polar bears and predators are kind of at the top. Polar bears eat seals, seals eat fish, fish eat algae. There, there are very nutrient rich zones. And Deanna was talking about those whales, right? And then um, I've got a question. What is your favorite Arctic plant? Oh, that's so hard because I love everything. Um, I'm probably going to say, if you were out there with me, a moss campion, it's like totally bright pink. It's totally bright pink. And it's a perfect cushion plant. I had a photograph of there was a there was like a cushion that was bright pink with flowers. That's probably on the day I see a lot of them. But being a botanist, it changed every, every plant is my favorite. Sorry. Pink is my favorite color. I fully support that decision. <laughs> oh, it's stunning. Another question. What's the rarest Arctic plant? That kind of depends where you are, but 
cool story. There is a tiny little plant called a brea. It's like in the mustard family and it's very rare. And in fact, about 10 years ago, um, the Canadian government and biologists thought it was extinct. Then, and they were looking for it, the populations couldn't find it, couldn't find it. Oh, we've got an extinct Arctic plant. They went back to the journals of one of the European explorers from like several hundred years ago who had noted it. And um, they actually used the information to go to where he said he saw it. And they took a helicopter up there. They actually found populations. So um, they're, they're, all Arctic plants are quite rare because there's very little cover and um, some are more common than others. But I get excited when I see certain species. But, you know, once you learn Arctic plants, you're going to go and you'll very easily learn them all. Yeah. So good questions. What interested you to study Arctic plants? Well, as I said, I was a field assistant to a grad student. And when I got up there, I did, because there's this species gradient, like there's a lot fewer plants in the arc. I, I, oh, there's a biodiversity gradient. Sorry, forgot to tell you. If you're in a tropical rainforest, you don't even know what you're looking at, right? There's just like millions of species. It's like, oh, it's crazy. How could you learn what the species are? You go to the Arctic, they're short and there's not many of them. So you can actually learn them. You can actually, if you were with me in the field, um, when I'm out teaching people botany on these, on these ecotourism trips and doing like public science, I have most people identifying most plants by 11 days. Okay, are we running out of time? Can I, okay, what is my favorite part about my job? Okay, um, students, my fa the favorite part of my job, you. Students. Oh, we've got, got a question yourself. from uh, that I think is important that's near the bottom, but uh, we had an anonymous attendee ask, uh, they didn't see the book Walking with uh, a, a, a L A. -S -S I'll just see, I'll put it in, I'll put a link in. I'll put okay, the link thank in. you, because they is, they were asking if it was a specific bookstore or something. Um, I'll type it into the Q&A. Uh, it's, it's a great book and, 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 and it's currently on sale. Oh, hey! Uh, the second gen so Walking with Alice is the first version, and then it was so popular that they updated it, and about six years ago. Okay, M most interesting plant I've dis I've never really discovered a plant. Um, so every time I go out, it's like just plants that other people have discovered, and I'm just seeing them again. Oh, funny story there. I drive my colleagues crazy because if we're um, leaving a site to go on the ship to the next bit of Greenland or something. And I'm walking down the hill or the mountain. Um, I'm looking at every plant and they're like, you're so slow. And I actually said to them, I can't not look at the plants. And they were like, hurry up. The last Zodiac is leaving. And they were like, stop looking at the plants. Okay. So, so yeah, yeah. It's just, they're so fun. Have I had a bad reaction to any of the plants I've been here? No, I, I am allergic to grass pollen, but that's when I'm studying sheep in farms in England or Canada and, you know, pollen, not up in the Arctic, no, but down here, ragweed, I'm very allergic. Is knowing and memorizing different plants hard? It's no more difficult than learning a language and you just get to look at lots of nice pictures i'm i've got all kinds of books i just like looking at pictures of plants then it sticks with you first time i went out in the field um 1980 i was 19 years old how often am i in the arctic quite a lot these days because i get to go back um does the environment affect how much of the flowers reproduce or go yes 110 percent how do these plants benefit us humans well berries if you like blueberries you can eat them in the Arctic. Uh, pretty in the summer. Yes, it is. Spooky things. Oh, I'll tell you a good story there. Um, uh, okay, I'm going to just put the, I'll just really quickly finish and then I'll get the, the information. What plants do indigenous people eat in the winter? The Inuit will eat their dried berries. Like they, they'll save them. They'll save them. Oh, and um, seaweed is really popular. You know, like seaweed that you would eat in sushi. A favorite Arctic animal. Hmm. Probably the, an Arctic fox. They're quite playful and naughty. Um, 
Are there any plants from the Arctic that can be found anywhere else in the world? Yes. People bring the seeds and grow them in their rock gardens. And uh, similar species are growing up mountains. Um, while I find Alice, Emma and Amber, can you just, are there any questions that I missed? Um, I don't believe so. I just, I love that we had a comment. Someone commented that the Arctic was super pretty in the summer and that they would love to visit. Um, that's oh, I, I, I hope you do. Um, okay, I am finding um, Inhabit Media. Hang on a minute. Uh, we do, uh, we are probably going to, just for everyone who's attending, we are going to put the book links uh, up on the NBTI website. Uh, so they will be up there probably soon-ish, a week tops. I guarantee it'll be less than a week. Uh, but we'll All right, but I, I, I'll put this, I just found the link and I will actually put it in the answered I, I, can i type the answer um uh right i'm gonna type the answer no it's gonna go to everybody there you are does every ah, can you see the answer um checking now did i send it um, i'll send it again i don't believe i did a response can i answer but how, how do i type into the q a should I put it in the chat? Uh, no, we oh, found yeah. it. So oh, if you go into answered, you'll see the links. Yes, it's in answers under the, it's the answer to the question about the book, uh, Walking with uh, LSC. I still don't know what else, I'm sorry. Um, but it, and it will be on the NBTI website as well. There you go. Um, so we, we do have plenty of time for questions. Uh, ah. We tra traded rooms with everybody so that the other presentation can start. So you can take as long as you'd like. Are there any other questions? I, I'm, I'm, I, let me see. I, I was going down. Are there any other? I think I've answered. Oh, spooky things about the Arctic. Um, no spooky things about living in, in the Arctic, but I will say that when I was a student and there were polar bears coming in Churchill, Northern Manitoba, we did have to be really careful about polar bears. And one time it was getting dark at the end of the summer. We were hoping to see the Northern lights, you know, the green and purple Aurora Borealis. And we could hear his, it was probably a polar bear. So we didn't go outside. So you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, but now they have a big electric fence around that goose camp, but yeah. And we did have a question from inside from, I, she is uh, where we are, she is the head of science for our district. Um, and she asked if you prefer studying structure and function of like the plants or like causes and effects of like climate change on Arctic plants, um, stuff like that. So that's a really good question. Um, I'm an ecologist. So I study the interactions between organisms and their environment. And I spend a lot of time counting leaves and twigs um, and I do applied ecology. So um, you can do, so I actually look at the impact of climate change on plants or I look at the impact of grazing by snow geese or down here in the Great Lakes, I look at how white-tailed deer affect forests. So I do both. And I think that um, in ecology, you kind of have to keep an eye open for everything which keeps it, which keeps everything changing all the time. There's always something new to learn. All right, that's awesome. So if there are no more questions, which I don't think there are, I haven't seen any new ones. Thank you so, so much for coming. You were like the big favorite today. When you came on, all the teachers, we went, oh, oh my gosh, she's here. All the teachers inside went, oh my gosh, it's done. Yay. We really appreciate it. It's lovely to be here. I'm so relieved that this isn't the last year because tell, <laughs> can you tell Debbie, please, um, that uh, Mrs. Perryman, um, oh, she changed her name though. Okay, because she, she has a new, she has a, like, I'm like- yeah, We know who you're talking about. We're you know who I mean. yeah. um, So that uh, that I inadvertently was tweeted, like I thought that it was the last year and I was like totally freaking out, which is why you got so many people attending from Canada. Cause I was like, oh, <laughs> it appreciate worked. it. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. much. You should do it every year. I'm, do it every year, yes. I'm very excited to know that this is not the last year and um, I will be getting lots of other fabulous speakers because I work with a lot of uh, colleagues, ecologists, uh, biologists who are so good at explaining about biodiversity.
Trust me, you gained a couple new fans. Like, yeah, yeah, we really like- enjoyed listening to you talk today. It was super cool. Back at you. Thank you so much. You've been an amazing uh, logistics technical support team. All right. And then uh, we just have like one more thing before like we fully wrap up uh, the national like biodiversity teaching. It's a student like led project. And the reason we can do it is because we have so many partners supporting us like uh, Earth Echo International. And this year, Earth Echo um, has a challenge called Our Echo. It's a STEM competition to students. And um, you can- Grades five to nine. Yep. And then you have different chances to win uh, top prizes of like, for example, uh, one, thousand dollars and there's uh two thousand five hundred dollars and there's five thousand dollars uh, and the submission closes on march 3rd 2023 at eleven fifty nine eastern not central um and if you want more information about this please email us we will be happy to provide it for you once again professor don thank you so much for coming and talking to us it was so much fun i hope to see you again soon thank Bye. you